Wake that ass up early in the morning. The Breakfast Club. Morning, everybody. It's DJ MV Angela Yee, Charlemagne the God. We are the Breakfast Club. We got a special guest in the building. Mm -hmm. We have Kevin O'Leary, aka Mr. Wonderful. Mr. Wonderful. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you. How you feeling? You came up with your own camera setup, his own setup. You came prepared. I don't mess around, man. <laughs> now, do you own any of these products? I just. Uh, th these are all Apple. I own the stock. Okay. Oh, you own the stock. <laughs> <laughs> you very popular, man. So, uh, all day long, people have been saying, Mr. Wonderful's coming up here. That's right. Well, I, I appreciate that. There's truth in advertising. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about Shark Tank. Now, you've been in Shark Tank for how long now? How long 14, 14 seasons. We're, we're all amazed by what this has turned into. It's fantastic. Do you still love it, and does it allow you to do your real job or all the other, other things that you have to do? Well, it's turned into my real job. I mean, we've been investing in companies now you know, dozens of them, if not, you know, 50, 60, 70 each. And some of them have been wildly successful. I mean, it is the American dream. That's what happens when you get ahead. And here's what I've learned. You don't know what's going to work. Mm -hmm. You may think you do. Mm -hmm. That's right. But each season, the deals that I think are real dogs end up being huge hits and vice versa. It, mm -hmm. You just don't know. So you need a portfolio. You need to do, you know, 10, 12 deals, hoping two or three really work out, pay for the mistakes. That's all you can hope to do, right? I mean, it's all a gamble at the end of the day. It is, it is. And it, and it's remarkable to see, you know, particularly during the pandemic, how these entrepreneurs pivoted, how they just had to chuck and jive to stay alive. I mean, it was really hard because they, they lost their retail distribution. Mm -hmm. And most of these companies are consumer goods and services. So if they don't have any distribution, they go to zero. And they figured out how to sell direct. They did, you know, something remarkable. They built businesses direct to consumer all around the world. Mm -hmm. And they started giving up retail because when you sell direct, your margins are much higher and you get all that information about your customer. Nike did the same thing during the pandemic. They went to 60% direct consumer around the world. So did the Shark Tank companies. You know what I wondered about uh, people, who, certain entrepreneurs during COVID, certain people created COVID-friendly businesses, things that worked during the pandemic. But were those good long-term things to invest in? You know, that's a great question. Um, what we found out is that people believe in more than just profits today. If there's a mission behind your business, if it's doing something great, if it's you know, providing for its community, you tend to get a very sticky customer. And if you're selling direct to them and you can communicate that mission, it outlasts just the pandemic. They, they feel like they're part of that community and they stay with you. That's what we learned. And so it's not just about making money anymore. That's okay. Profits are still cool. But that's how you stay in business and you hire people. But people want more. They want more. Like a company like Blue Land that took out the plastic waste of cleaning fluids. There's no bottle anymore. It's just a tablet. And people really got into that during the pandemic because mm -hmm. they couldn't buy this stuff. You remember, for a while, they'd mm -hmm. shut down even Walmart. Mm -hmm. So if you yeah. needed a cleaning fluid, you got it direct from Blue Land. Now they're selling 50, 60 million a year direct to consumers that are into the mission of cleaning up the oceans. Mm. I saw one that you guys did that was a ring light. Because obviously people, even after the pandemic, ring lights got so popular during. But now I feel like people are never going to stop using ring lights. It's something that... That's right. Need. And that ring light company made one with a little star mm -hmm. in your eye, reflecting in your eye. And I have that thing back Wow. There. It's so cool. You stick it in front of you. And when you're doing your selfies, there's two stars in your eyes. Cool idea. Mm -hmm. Right. I was going to ask, what was the most successful company you invested in, in Shark Tank? In the history of the show, the biggest exit, it was one called Plated that was bought by Albertsons for $340 million. Mm -hmm. That was my deal. And um, there's about to be another one that'll get announced in the next few weeks that'll be the second largest. Uh, also my deal. So I'm getting very lucky with these things because, and again, they're ones that I never thought. I mean, this one that's about to happen, I'd love to tell you about it today, but I can't because it's, it's a public company that's buying it, was the stupidest thing I've ever seen. <laughs> I mean, I couldn't believe what it was and I did it because I thought it was great TV but it, it turned into a monster business a huge business and bingo um, it's being acquired and that woman is going to be very very wealthy now you wow. said the one you bought for 340,000 what, what did you want million million, million. million. Oh, million. let's not make that million. mistake Sorry. million <laughs> million Sorry. we can get in on this <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah it was it was uh, that was if you remember there was a time when um, meal kits People would ship an uncooked meal to your door, and mm -hmm. then you'd cook the food. Yep, so it was your portion. That got really big. And that was one of the biggest companies played. It was bought by Albertson because they wanted a digital version to what they did in a grocery store. Gotcha. And that, 
it was a huge deal. And that's when we began to realize that Shark Tank, the real secret sauce of Shark Tank and why it works year in, year out is the number one reason companies go out of business in America is they can never get their customer acquisition costs below the lifetime value. A fancy way of saying they advertise themselves into bankruptcy. Mm. They can't acquire customers. Now, with Shark Tank, you get 100 million eyeballs through syndication. Mm -hmm. right. So if you even have a mediocre product, you're kicking it when you're on Shark Tank, but you got to get a deal. Everybody thinks you can come on and not close a deal. Then you don't get updates. You don't get the benefit long term. You never exactly. show up again. And I think that's kind of what people have figured out about it. If they can get on Shark Tank and get into syndication, they're going to be out there forever. Now, question. When, when they come on Shark Tank, let's say they don't get a deal. Does Shark Tank or do you guys still get some type of percentage if they do so? Because, I mean, you guys are still advertising them on the show. Yeah. Very shrewd question. There was a time when that was happening. But in season three, we killed that because it stopped good companies from coming on board. If mm -hmm. they weren't guaranteed a deal, why are they giving up equity? Correct. And so in, in season four, we changed that policy. And that's when we started getting real companies with real shareholders, with real venture capitalists. And now we get all kinds of deals. And the deal sizes are huge. They're millions of dollars now. It used to be 50 grand here, 100,000 there. Now it's two, three, four, five million bucks. Do you have any regrets when you look back at maybe talking to a business owner and being really harsh with them? Because sometimes people are so passionate about their businesses and then you can look back and say, damn, maybe I shouldn't have said it that way. They say you're the mean guy. No, I just tell the truth. And if you can't handle the truth, the real world's going to bite your hiney anyway. But sometimes it's wrong, right? No, nope, like I'm never some wrong. Of those businesses have been successful. <laughs> I, look, you know, the point is, I just tell it the way I see it. And, mm -hmm. and I think that is important. I think it's very disingenuous. And I say this to Barbara all the time and, and Lori. You're not going to give these people a dime. And you're telling them to go on and keep doing what they're doing when you know they're going to zero. Mm -hmm. So it's, it, why are you doing that? Why don't you tell them the truth? You're, it, your idea sucks. It's going to zero. You're going to go bankrupt unless you stop. Go do something else. But look, the <laughs> girls from the Lip Bar are on. They're from Detroit. And they were on the show. And their business has been pretty successful. And they're doing well. They're in Target. They're in all these stores. They yeah, they rub that in my face even on billboards. All the time. They, yep, I saw the billboards <laughs> in Detroit. What's but the billboards say? It says, Mr. Wonderful's wrong. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I just saw those because they had their 10-year anniversary. But that's what I'm saying. Like, Look, I'm, pr I'm proud of them for taking the heat. I'm proud that their entrepreneurs are successful. It's a wonderful thing to see that happen. Mm -hmm. But they were facing an almost impossible task because going into the cosmetics industry is so difficult to get market share, but they pulled yeah. it off. So look, you gotta, you gotta applaud them. There's no question about it. But that is a tough space because the margins are so high that the competition is brutal. It's mm -hmm. just brutal. What's, what are your thoughts on the metaverse? So here's a big debate about the metaverse, and I'm, I'm pretty heavy into the digital space now uh, because I, I believe, you know, the people think, let's start at Bitcoin, the granddaddy asset, right? Everybody thinks it's a coin. It's not, it's software. It's software, and software that can have product, you know, a lot of productivity to it in financial services. The issue about the metaverse is this. What is the business model going to be? Let's say I'm a brand like Procter & Gamble or Nike or a huge global brand and I want to have my own store in the metaverse. I think that's got to be a curated metaverse. So I, I'm not so I'm not being set up beside a porn shop, right? I care about what community I'm in. I care about how my brand's represented. I want some control over that. Then there's the unfettered, uncurated version of the metaverse where anything goes and that's a different version of it. But I don't think that's going to get as many brands to support it. And then you have to ask yourself, is it an advertising model or is it a transaction model or is it both? And these are all unknowns. So Web3 is an unknown, you know, we're in the very first innings of Web3 and you got to place a lot of bets out there, a lot of bets. And so I'm, I'm investing in all kinds of companies, not knowing which one's going to be successful, no different than Shark Tank. Mm -hmm. Do brands still, you know, care about who buys their products? Because, you know, you, you, when you're talking about being in the metaverse, like, I be thinking sometimes they just want the eyeballs. They just want the engagement. They just want people to see their product. Do they care about who they're really in front of? That's a great question. But if, you, if, you're, if you've built a brand that is important, that you think means something to somebody, and all of a sudden it's beside a weed shop, you're not cool with that because you've spent billions of dollars promoting whatever your brand is about. So I think you do care. I don't think that's going to change. Probably the platform that everybody hates that has the biggest chance of making it work on a curated basis is going to be Facebook. They've already got two billion people, mm -hmm. and they're there waiting to see what the next iteration of Meta is going to be. And I, you know, Facebook's had a rough time, and so have all these stocks. They've been cut in half in some cases. But mm -hmm. at the end of the day, 
who is going to set this up so that it works for both the community and for the brand? Mm-hmm. Brands aren't going to change. There's mm-hmm. certain things you buy because you like the brand. That's right. Yeah. And I think they're going to be want to rep- they're, they're going to want to be represented on the metaverse according to their version of what they are. You also have a cryptocurrency folder, and people are so concerned about crypto right now and about the prices dropping. So I want to get your thoughts on it because I know it's something that you've put a portion of your assets into. Yeah. So let's go back to traditional investing. Let's say you're a sovereign wealth fund running $100 billion. That's a small sovereign wealth fund. Here are the rules you play by pre-crypto. You'd be no more than 20% in any one sector of the economy. And in our economy, we have 11 sectors, okay? So energy is a sector, so no more than 20% in energy. And then within a sector, no more than 5% in any one stock. Mm -hmm. That's diversification. That's how it was played. Now, I believe that in the next decade, crypto, blockchain, and all of the productivity that provides will become the 12th sector of the economy. And so there will be many companies that service that 12th sector, but I'm investing according to that kind of metric. I've put 20% of our operating company's portfolio into crypto across 32 different positions. Wow. And so I've, I own a lot of different things, Polygon, Helium, Pollen, uh, Solana, you know, Ethereum, Bitcoin, yada, 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 all, and on and on, not knowing which is going to survive, because I don't know. Mm-hmm. But if you have enough diversification, you only need one or two to work. And then you're in good shape. And that's the way I think you got to think about crypto. It's just software. These are software developers. There's nothing magical about it. But the reason you should care is that the productivity that it's going to provide, let's just take, for example, USDC, stablecoin. Mm-hmm. Yesterday, Circle, the company that issues USDC, closed a deal, first time ever, with Fidelity and BlackRock for $400 million. Those are the most conservative money managers on earth. What are they doing giving 400 million bucks to Circle? Because they figured out that as a payment system, it's far more efficient than transferring between banks, which sucks. It takes days to move money between countries. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it gets lost. This would all be eradicated with something like USDC pegged to the US dollar. You've got the Senate, you've got Senator Loomis, or you've got uh, Toomey and Haggerty all putting bills forward to support these initiatives. So you got policy coming. I think Fidelity and BlackRock saw the policy, talked to the senators, said, okay, this is going to be, become legal one day. We want to get ahead of it. And already in, in stable coins, there's $120 billion right now. And that's before it becomes regulated. So there's a lot of stuff happening here. I'm a big investor. You know, I use Circle. I use the products. Why? Because I can make 4% interest by lending it out mm-hmm. with a 30-day note. That makes sense to me. I can't do that in a bank. I'm going to make 40 basis points. And inflation six, so I'm losing money putting money in a bank. Let's talk about inflation a little bit. Real quick, what's what's a greater risk asset, uh, asset, cryptocurrency or NFTs? That's a great question. I I would say there's two types of NFTs, okay? NFTs that are tied to physical assets. Let me give you an example. Mm -hmm. Here's a watch. I'm a huge watch collector, okay? Mm -hmm. This is an FP Jordan. Mm -hmm. How do I know it's real? How do I know it's not fake? Mm-hmm. Rolex is knocked off like crazy. How do I know that? It, that's NAP. Mm-hmm. How do I know it's real? Mm-hmm. If that had an NFT associated with it, with the authenticated papers, an image of the box, the serial number, the caliber, mm. and a high scanned image of the dial, which has tiny imperfections in it, the, the fingerprint of it, mm-hmm. I wouldn't have to get that authenticated if I bought it from you. You just show me the NFT, mm. I'd rescan the watch. Yeah, it's the original watch. Sure, it's going to have some patina on it, but. That NFT is extremely valuable because it represents the physical asset. Now, a lazy ape, I don't know. Yeah. (laughs) Right? Because I see people doing it now with with homes now. They're doing NFTs with with homes and actual products. Yeah. Which seems more sensible than, like you said, a lazy ape. Exactly. So I think, you you know, you're going to have the scammers in a new space like this. There's no policy. If an NFT has utility, let's say you're getting an NFT and you get tickets to the Formula One race. That sounds like a security to me because it's got something of value associated with it, almost like a dividend. So if you're getting a royalty or something, I think that at some point the regulator is going to say, look, uh, we're, we're, that's a security. You've got to have a prospectus with it. But regulation's not a bad thing, and I'll tell you why. Right now, I work in the indexing space for sovereign wealth funds and pension plans. So when they want to design an index, let's say they're an oil-rich country and they want to invest in the S&P, they say, give me the S&P, X oil, and X airlines. I don't want to own any airlines or oil stocks because we already got all the oil we need. Mm -hmm. So we index. Indexers like me do that for them. 
they do not own any crypto, zero. And yet they're running hundreds of billions of dollars. If they were allowed to buy Bitcoin, they'd put a 1% weighting in it. Then you'd start to see the value of crypto go up because there'd always be a market bid for it. Right now, there's no bid, there's no institution. It's just, everybody thinks, oh, crypto's fantastic. Nobody owns Bitcoin. The mm -hmm. truth is most investors don't own it. There's only 800 billion of it, which by the way is nothing in financial services. You gotta ta start talking about five, six, seven, eight trillion dollars. You gotta get to 12 trillion. And the only way you're gonna get that is if it becomes an institutional product. I was wow. asking before you mentioned inflation and, and interest rates. So what are your thoughts on the, the fact that interest rates are shooting through the roof right now as far as mortgage rates, car loans, and, and bank loans right now, and, and inflation? How, how does that affect what's going on in the next couple of years? Well, the two biggest moves in inflation are self-inflicted wounds. One is energy costs, mm -hmm. four, five, six dollar gallon of oil or of gas. Yes, uh -huh. We did that to ourselves. We shut down all the production. That was not smart. I think we figured that out. We're going to have to solve for that real fast because you know if you're looking at the midterm elections this is a political issue now in addition to that food prices so protein like chicken or you know fish or any of that they're up 30 40 50 percent that's because supply chains broken we can't get stuff from one port to another even now it's still broken and so half of this stuff will be tempered as the economy gets back in i think half the inflation is kind of permanent but half is supply chain so I, I think things are going to be okay. Um, I think inflation in the back end of the year will probably settle back down from 8% down to maybe 5 which would be good. The Fed's going to raise another 50 basis points twice at least. So we're going to get up to 3 4% real cost of money, and it'll balance itself out. I don't see a disaster coming because this cycle we are in full employment. We, we have everybody working. You can't you try and hire somebody right here in New York at a restaurant, forget about it. You can't get anybody to work because they don't want to or they already have a job so you know we're in a funky place right now and you have a you got a, a startup investing platform that allows people to become sharks and they can invest in new and upcoming companies right start yeah. engine yeah this is something that came out of the jobs act years ago uh, mm -hmm. the government wisely decided why is it that only really rich people can be involved in venture startups like the guys that first invested in google or in apple you know mm -hmm. or in microsoft they were traditional venture firms. Why can't we democratize this? And so what they created was an opportunity to do equity crowdfunding. And Start Engine's the biggest of that. So the way this works is you're a company, you're a startup, maybe you're an underserved community, mm -hmm. right? And you want access to capital. You tell your story on a startup platform like Start Engine, and hundreds of thousands of investors can make an investment in it. 200 bucks, 300 bucks, 1,000 bucks, whatever they want. They become founding shareholders beside you. And it's done in a, in a really democratic way. There's no preference share. The trouble with venture capital is you want to raise three million bucks, they say, okay, we have to be special shareholders. We get our money back first. We have a preference share. We have control over you in ways that no one else has. That sucks. Mm -hmm. I don't understand why anybody would do that to themselves. And look, I've been involved in venture capital my whole life and I know how the game works. But bottom line is this is a new way to actually raise capital. Now, it got better just a few months ago when the government said, okay, it used to be the maximum you could raise was $1,070,000. Now, you can raise up to $5 million. And that's wow. very competitive to what t traditional hedge funds do, private equity funds do, mm -hmm. venture funds. So now Start Engine, which is basically, look, I'm going to be I'll disclose to you, I'm a paid spokesperson, but I'm also a shareholder in it. This thing works. I put my Shark Tank companies on this. So if they want to raise dough, they go out there and say, look, I'm going to raise two or three or four million dollars and you can have a piece of it right beside me. That matters a lot because you're going to be just like me. You're, we're, we're all equal on this journey together. And Start Engine itself, the engine platform itself is raising its own money on its own Start Engine. So if you want to be an investor mm -hmm. in the platform itself, they're raising a round right now, another 40 million dollars on their platform. Are yeah, we've had, people come up, we've had people come up in and, uh, you know, try to crowdfund with Start Engine. Yeah. Yeah, like um, uh, fan, fan base did that. They, fan base did that. Yeah, they because got like you can, you can, if you 000. already have customers, if you're selling a product or service and you've got, let's say, 10,000 customers or even 1,000 customers, you can go to them and say, look, I know you're using my product or service. How would you like to be a shareholder beside me? And you're going to find some large percentage say, hey, I'm happy to do that. And frankly, they have a very long-term view. Instead of saying, oh, I'm in a fund that I have to you know, get liquid in three years or five years, they may stay with it their whole lives. The guy that started this... Howard Marks came out of Activision. He was one of the co-founders of Activision. He mm. gets the joke. 
He's been doing this a long time. And so he knows that startups, and when you invest in startups, you need diversification. I talked earlier about how you, you don't want to be too concentrated in any one deal. If you're investing in Start Engine, I recommend you buy seven or eight deals. Build a portfolio because you don't know what's going to work. Mm. Do you have to give up equity when uh, you, if you're on here and you're raising money from Start Engine? Yeah, of course. Yeah, okay. You're selling shares to shareholders, and you, but you, as the founder, set the price. Mm -hmm. so, and you discern what the market wants to do. You tell your shareholders, look, I'm going to do another round. I'm going to raise another three million bucks. But at least it's in a way that's very democratic and very diverse, and you get a lot of shareholders. Instead of having one VC shareholder that owns 30% of your company, you get 3,000 people. So they're the, that's why they call it equity crowdfunding. You've mm -hmm. got a real herd of people that care about your brand. I was going to ask, you know, you, you talk about in this music industry that everybody's a workaholic, right? They work hard, they outwork everybody, but you don't necessarily believe or hire workaholics. No, no. Why I not? don't I don't hire workaholics. I'll tell you why. If you look at, you know, productivity, in other words, great managers, great investors, great entrepreneurs, you're going to find a common trait, and I'll tell you what it is. Mm -hmm. And I've, I've seen this happen over and over again. Ask that man or woman, you know, what they do with their spare time, if they have any. And you're going to find out it's something in the arts or it's something in sports or it's something that has nothing to do with business because you need the balance in your brain of the, you know, the yin and the yang, <laughs> as I call it, between the chaos of the arts and the discipline of business, which is very binary. Either you make money, you lose it. And I found the greatest managers for mm. me are ex-dancers or artists or archers or you know, soccer players, or where they have some discipline in their life that they really struggled with early on. When you start dancing at four years old and you're still dancing when you're 32, that's a big deal. Mm -hmm. You're going in every day and it's in your head and that makes you very, very effective and that's what I find. So I'm always asking people, you know, what else do you do? Like you sound great on paper, but tell me about yourself. If they're a great guitarist or a violinist or a painter, that makes me very interested because all of the people I work with have some other discipline that they're very good with and my team is really efficient that way. They still get their job done, but they pursue other things that kind of gives them more productivity in their brains. That's what I think. Yeah. And it's, it's, look, I'm just doing what works for me. And the other thing that's happened to me over these 14 years on Shark Tank, the majority of my returns have come from companies run by women, 75%. Mm -hmm. So that's why I tend to invest in women entrepreneurs because they're very good at mitigating risk. You know, that old adage, you want something done, give it to a busy mother. That's true in business. I agree 100%. And, Absolutely. and, and the, the discipline that you talk of, I think that's why they're so successful as well. But could you, could you expound on that? Because I love that jewel that you just gave. You said the chaos of the arts. And, yeah. And the, the, what is it? The... Th think about writing a song, you know, some of the greatest hits ever written. Um, I was listening to this documentary about the Bee Gees, one of the most successful mm -hmm. bands in history. There was only one brother left, but he was talking about one day they were on their way to the, their, their recording studio in Miami. And this was the time when they were doing Saturday Night Fever, which ended up being one of the biggest albums ever. And there's that, you know, there's a, there's a, there's a track that has sort of a really funky riff in it. And the reason it happened was the tires were going over the Miami causeway between metal grate and concrete, metal grate and concrete. So it started to get in a groove, and Barry was listening to it, and he, and he was, you know, just... Because it was just going over and over and over. And he walked into the studio and said to the drummer, I got this thing in my head. I just got out of the limo. Make this sound for me. And that turned into one of the greatest hits they ever had. Just chaos, mm -hmm. yeah, right? Yeah, just yeah. in a limo, listening to the grate on the wheel, the rubber wheel. That's the kind of thing that gives you productivity in business. Same thing. Something hits your head, came out of the arts, and you apply that. Okay. Maybe you're coding, maybe you're doing something else. I think I'm a big believer in that. Now, on Shark Tank, how often do you invest in somebody who maybe their vision isn't quite there, but you like their personality? Is that something that w you would do, or is it strictly business? No, maybe you feel no. like they're charismatic, it could go somewhere, you can see them being a good spokesperson for something, you see the potential. Yeah, listen, I think it's all about the jockey, because if you, you think about, particularly this last two years, if you didn't know how to pivot, you went out of business. Mm. So you you have to look at that entrepreneur knowing their business plan is full of shit. They have no idea what's going to happen. <laughs> mm -hmm. And th they just don't know. I've never seen a business plan that didn't look terrific, right? Everything's going up to the right. Everybody's numbers are going to go through the roof. But that's not how it works. Shit happens. And you have to be able to deal with it. And that's why you need the arts. You know, you need some other aspects, some other place you can go in your head to solve these problems. 
and figure out what is the path of least resistance to success. Because right now we're in a bear market and a lot of companies used to have access to cheap capital, don't have that anymore. Now they got to pivot. This is where they're really going to get tested. And I think that's important. It happens every seven, eight years. Now you sharks get tested with each other sometimes when you guys are actually like uh, one of the uh, Shark Tank contestants that come up there. So what is something that you missed out on that you still kick yourself out uh, about to this day? Well, it's Ring. Everybody knows yeah. that deal. <laughs> and and, and uh, we're friends now, but I offered <laughs> I offered him the 600000 yeah. but he wouldn't take it. I, I put it out as debt. I was the only shark that believed in him. Um, I would have made about... Four hundred million on that deal. Goodness gracious! So that really sucks. But at the you know same time he did the right thing for him, and mm -hmm. that's okay. Um, Jamie, pretty good guy, and pretty get, good guy. Pretty it, good it, guy. Was too much <laughs> we, we was it too much equity? Was that what it was? No, it? He, the problem was he was burning through so much cash that I knew he'd have to keep raising money, and I'd get diluted. So what I said to him was, "Look, give me two and a half percent warrants. That's that's just my little you know, it's my, my little kiss. I'll give you six hundred thousand in debt for three years at seven percent." which I thought was a reasonable offer. He said, I don't want any debt. I said, well, it's my 600,000. Like, you know, I, I'll take a little bit of equity and you can go raise more. I know I'll get diluted, but at least I'll get my 600,000 back plus 7%, which I thought was very reasonable. He didn't take the deal, mm. but it would have been a great deal for me and it would have been a good deal for him, but it doesn't matter at this point. That's water under the bridge. I thought Barbara was on this show before the pandemic. What, didn't she come yeah, in here? Yes, she was. You yeah. know how she got here? I bought her a new broom. She flew in. <laughs> the two of you go, the two of you go at it all so, the time. Yeah, but you guys love each other behind the scenes. We do actually. She's uh, we're both <laughs> we're both cooks, and um, she's a very good cook actually. And we often uh, you know have dinner at her apartment. It's fantastic. She, we, we've been doing this together for fourteen mm -hmm. years. Mm -hmm. I mean that's a really long time. So uh, all of us, you know, and, and we're very proud of what we've built. And it's an iconic platform in America, and it and it creates millionaires and billionaires hopefully one day and it helps us watching if we ever need to pitch something because I watch Shark Tank all the time for when I have to do my pitches to know what to do and what not to do yeah you know there is something I would tell you um, that I've learned over these years and it may sound crazy but it's true I'm sitting right in front of them when they walk out on the carpet and what you don't know about the show is that um, when they step out the floor director says okay stand right there because they they need a jib shot and they need the steady cam to come over and get a shot of their product with the team standing there and that takes mm -hmm. about two and a half minutes to get it right they'll keep shooting until they get it right but they just have to stand there and can, can say nothing and i do this thing where i just look at them i don't blink i don't smile i just look at them and i watch their body language and i can tell after about 90 seconds winner loser Mm. the ability to present yourself physically without speaking a word, your presence, your aura is a big deal. It's a big deal because you only walk into a room and meet new people once mm. and they, they're looking at you, you're looking at them and it's how you deal with that nervousness, that nervous energy. And, and I, I, I keep doing this. I mean, maybe, maybe, maybe it's mean to me. I don't think so though because I can tell the ones that push back, that have the guts to take the heat, because now there's 26 cameras on them, the lights are on, they've been practicing in front of a mirror for two months, but now it's the real deal. And they're in there, and the camera's are about to roll, and you can see them sweating bullets there, because even the ones that think they had it nailed are dealing with the reality of being in front of, you know, billions of dollars, an opportunity of a lifetime, the world's gonna meet them. Some of them don't make it. Some of them pass right out, you don't see that. But they? Oh yeah. Oh wow. They just. How many have passed out? We had to get a couple. Pulled? Really? Yeah. You know I how mean, it. Ha you know yeah. that phenomenon when you're in a drum crew, like drumming on the football field. If you lock your knees for more than two yeah. and a half minutes, you're oh, gonna pass, pass out. out. That's what happened. There was a guy who was six foot four in front of me, mm -hmm. and I st I could start to see him. Days and off. Nose dive right into the cr concrete, oh. like unbelievable. And we had. We had to shut that set down. We had that to get the harsh. medics in there. Goodness. He was okay. He was okay. No problem. But wow. Hey, stuff happens. Jeez. How'd you get the name Mr. Wonderful? That's very WWE. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, we think, and we haven't found the tape, that it, it might have been Barbara back in season one when I made some aggressive deal to somebody and, you know, she didn't like it. And she said, well, isn't that just wonderful? 
And I said, yeah, it is a wonderful deal. And it, it just kind of stuck. And, and uh, Or it could have happened before then. We're not sure. I, I, it might have been in a previous show. I don't know. But it, it's sort of, um, it's amazing because a lot of people don't know my name anymore. They just call me Mr. <laughs> Wonderful. Like I'll walk in, get picked up by a limo at LAX, and there's a sign saying Mr. Wonderful. And I say to the guy, do you know my name? He says, no idea. But you are Mr. Wonderful, aren't you? I say, <laughs> yeah. It's kind of weird. <laughs> Your uh, tips always pop up in my Google searches. Like it'll be certain things that you say on like CNBC or different conversations you have about finances and money. But it, they don't call you Mr. Wonderful on there. Yeah. I, you know, it's... Um, I'm an investor, and I've learned a few things over the years. And, you know, I've, I think... Um, and I'm trying to teach my kids how to do this and, and others. It's not easy, but there's certain disciplines you learn because everybody makes mistakes. And so I try and, you know, say, look, this is how I do it. I'm not sure how you're going to do it, but this is how I do it. I'm all about diversification. I like to mitigate risk, but I also take some big chances on stuff. And sometimes I'm right, sometimes I'm wrong. Mm -hmm. um, and I, you know, I, I'm, I think financial literacy is a mess in this country. We don't teach anybody anything in high school, which is mm -hmm. crazy. We teach them about sex and geography and everything else in history, but we don't tell them what debt is. Right. Like, that's nuts. And so Florida, where I'm living, we've got that in the curriculum now. They're talking about it here in New York. Mm -hmm. uh, Texas and California, that's about 60% of the educational market, the 110,000 school buildings in, in America. We should be talking about credit card debt day one. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. That's what should be happening. Do you prefer being a solo investor or do you like when you guys team up? Much prefer solo. I, I like to control the deal. Um, but sometimes it's a really hot deal. You're going to have to go in with other sharks if you want a piece of it. And then the teams, we've been working together. We have our own analysts and everything else. And they work out the deal and due diligence and we paper it up. And uh, But, you know, I can do – the whole thing is my job for these investors is to get their story out there. So, you know, I've got a huge social media team. I got millions of followers. When I get into a product, it's because I believe in it and I use it. You know, something like uh, Banana Loca. I don't know if you saw that deal where you, you, you with, the, with the peel still on a banana, you can actually fill it with peanut butter, mm -hmm. which kids love because they take it in their, you know, lunchbox and they open it. They say, look, this, this, this banana grew up with peanut butter in it. And they just peel it off and it's already full of peanut butter or jelly, whatever it is. That looked like a really stupid product to me when I saw it. Mm -hmm. But boy, is that thing selling. <laughs> like, it's it's fantastic. Now, I'm in that deal with Cuban. We both liked it. So, had to put put it together. It, yeah. And that's good. That, that, we do a lot of stuff together. All right. Well, Kevin O'Leary, ladies and gentlemen. Mr. Mr. Wonderful. Wonderful. Mr. Wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> now, tell them uh, the start engine, the, the site, so people want to go to the site and possibly pitch their business. They yeah, I, I highly recommend it. Checking out startengine.com. Just the, the, the thing to do there is simply go to the, to, the, to the website and look at all the deals. See how others are presenting themselves. Mm -hmm. Even underserved communities. Everybody can raise money on there. It's not, it's not an exclusive thing for just you know, venture capitalists. It's anybody that wants to raise capital for any business has any idea. And that's how it should be. That's how you democratize investing. But you get, the reason you care about the platform is it has the one thing you need. It's got investors, hundreds of thousands of them every day combing, looking for another deal. Most of the guys that are, and women that are investing on there know that they want seven or eight deals. So they're looking for the next deal. Oh, I like that idea. I like that idea. I like that idea. I'm going to put a little bit of that into my portfolio. And they hold these portfolios on Start Engine. I can't, listen, I'm a big believer in it and it's it's growing. And if you want to invest in Start Engine itself, you can do it now because they're raising another round so you can invest in, in the mother engine itself, which I think is a great investment. And shout out All to right. Dawn Dixon from Popcom. She's on there too. She's been on the show before a couple of times. Yeah. And she's on Start Engine. I'm actually doing some stuff with her with her vending machines. Start Engine in the last, I'd say, you know, 18 months has really taken off. And primarily, I think it's because it went to the $5 million limit. Mm -hmm. Because all of a sudden, everybody realized, whoa, this is for real. Have you invested in cannabis? I can't do cannabis because of Schedule One narcotic issue. So the, the trouble with cannabis, um, I've invested in psychedelics. I'm a big holder of a lot of the companies that are doing psychedelics as medicine through you know FDA trials. But here's the problem with cannabis. It's got to get off the Schedule One narcotic list because mm -hmm. if you're in one state that where it's legal and you're right beside Florida, for example, where it's not, and you aid and abet the transportation of a Schedule One narcotic over the border, you go to jail for 23 years. That's right. 
I mean, that's crazy. And it's crazy because President Biden said he was going to decriminalize, you know, marijuana. I think he's got caught up in a few other issues now. I mean, you think? Yeah, it's a little bit, it's a bit, and the fact that, you know, because it is, banks won't take the money. It's the whole thing's nuts. And so y- y- you got to standardize the policy. It would have been better for the industry had to, you know, to go and say, look, we're going to take it in as a medicine. That way you could have got institutional investors to support it. Right now, the fact that it's a rogue product in some places, legal in others, I mean, it's chaos. It is. Mm -hmm. And and I I think that's got to get cleaned up. I mean, other countries have just basically made it legal um, with all kinds of rules and regulations. But, you know, I warn investors about cannabis. It's a commodity, Mm -hmm. okay? It's a weed. The best place to grow it is at the equator where you get five crops, not up in northern, you know, not in New York. That's dumb. You're putting, it's very expensive to make it there. So it's really going to shake itself out as it becomes legal. And I think edibles and consumables may work, but it's got to be legal. I mean, you know, I'm in the wine business and we've been looking at, you know, cannabis infused beverages for a while, but we can't get around the RICO statute issue. We appreciate you for joining us. Kevin O'Leary, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Breakfast Club, good morning.